Well, thank you very much, Jamie, so much. Um, my name is Erin Kepke, and I work uh, with the Communications and Outreach Department at World Food Program USA. World Food Program USA is a nonprofit organization that builds support in the United States to end global hunger. WFP USA engages individuals, organizations, and shapes public policy, so we do have a pretty substantial advocacy arm and generates resources for the United Nations World Food Program. The United Nations World Food Program is the world's largest humanitarian uh, agency fighting hunger worldwide. WFP is part of the United Nations system and is voluntarily funded, meaning we have to raise the funds in order to feed the world's hungriest people. WFP pursues a vision of the world in which every man, woman, and child has access at all times to food needed for an active and healthy life. So that is no small feat. On average, WFP aims to reach more than 90 million people with food assistance in more than 73 countries. Around 15,000 people work for the organization, most of them in remote areas serving directly for the hungry poor. Well, my role I have just been clicking on through, no one told me. My role working with World Food Program USA is to reach out to individuals, civic organizations, universities, and K through 12 communities to spread the word that hunger is a problem, uh, but it's also a solvable problem. So I'm really excited to be here, um, not only to, to give a broad overview of global hunger, but also to work with you guys at lunch this afternoon and through the lesson plan developing sessions to get an idea of what it is you need, resources you need in the classroom, what do your students need, and what would best mobilize support to get on board with this cause. So with that, I have been asked to give an overview of global hunger, <laughs> which is kind of funny. It is a very, very complicated issue. Lucky for you, I work in communications, and I am responsible for taking all of that wonky legislative language and incredibly grim statistics and putting it into a puzzle piece that hopefully spreads the message and encourages and engages individuals to take action. So how I've structured this presentation today is basically an overview of what I wish I had learned when I first started at World Food Program USA, which was just a year ago. Um, so we're gonna go over a few key questions, like what is hunger? Who are the hungry? Where is hunger happening? What is malnutrition? And then we're gonna talk about the solutions to those problems um, and how you can be a part of them. So I hope you all have had your coffee because this might be a little bit of a roller coaster. A lot of grim facts are about to um, be sent your way. Apologies for that. But we will end the presentation on a positive note, I promise. So hunger, the world's greatest solvable problem. Um, before we get into the solvable part, I need to talk about the greatest problem part. Um, in order to do that, these are the questions that we're going to be looking at today. What is hunger? Who are the hungry? what causes hunger, and what is malnutrition. So what is hunger? Acute hunger or starvation are often highlighted on TV screens. Hungry mothers too weak to breastfeed their children, refugees lining up to receive food rations, or high energy biscuits being airlifted into areas that have recently been affected by a tsunami or earthquake. These situations are a result of high profile crises like war or natural disasters, which do starve a population of food, but emergencies represent less than 8% of hunger's victims. Daily undernourishment is a less visible form of hunger. To those that are undernourished, hunger is much, much more than just an empty stomach. For weeks or even months, hunger's victims must live on significantly less than the recommended 2,100 kilocalories per day that the average person needs to lead a healthy, active life. The body compensates for this lack of energy by slowing down its physical and mental activities. A hungry mind cannot concentrate, a hungry body does not take the initiative, and a hungry child does not participate in being a child, so they cannot play or they cannot study. Hunger also weakens the immune system. Deprived of the right nutrition, hungry children are especially vulnerable and become too weak to fight off disease and may die from infections like diarrhea or measles. 
Each year, almost 11 million children in developing countries die before reaching the age of five, and malnutrition is associated with 53% of these deaths. In the final quarter of the 20th century, we were winning the war on our oldest enemy. From 1970 to 1997, the number of hungry people dropped from 959 million to 791 million, and this is mainly the result of dramatic progress in reducing the number of malnourished people in China and India. In the second half of the 1990s, however, the number of chronically hungry in developing countries started to increase at a rate of almost 4 million per year. By 2001 to 2003, the total number of undernourished people worldwide had risen to 854 million, and the latest figure is now a whopping 925 million hungry people worldwide. That means one in seven does not get enough hungry, does not get enough food to be healthy, making hunger and malnutrition the number one risk to health worldwide. And this is greater than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. So where is hunger? This is a no-brainer, but uh, the world's hungry live mostly in developing countries. According to the latest Food and Agricultural Organization Statistics, or the FAO, there are 925 million hungry people in the world, and 98% of them are in developing countries. So this is, this is a WFP map of global hotspots. And the world's hungry can be divided, um, summed up like this. So there are 500, all right, 578 million in Asia and the Pacific, 239 million in Sub-Saharan Africa, 53 million in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, and 19 million in developing countries. The best thing to remember here is that 578 million live in Asia and the Pacific. A lot, a big common misconception is that most people do live in Africa, hungry people live in Africa. That's not true. So who does hunger affect? Is the presentation gonna tell me before I do? Who are the hungry? With almost a billion people struggling with hunger every day, most of them can be seen as follows. Villagers, people that live in rural areas. Farmers, which is actually a little counterintuitive. Children and women, these represent the most vulnerable people that suffer from hunger every day. Rural risk. Three quarters of all hungry people live in rural areas, mainly in the villages of Asia and Africa. These villages are overwhelmingly dependent on agriculture for their food. These populations have no alternative source of income or employment. As a result, they are obviously very vulnerable to crisis. Many migrate to cities in search of employment uh, or food, swelling the ever-expanding populations of shanty towns, or they migrate abroad. Hungry farmers. FAO calculates that half, half of the world's hungry people are from smallholder farming communities. So does anyone remember the total number of hungry people in the world? 925 million. So the, hungry, the total amount of hungry farmers in the world is about 500 million. So they're surviving off of marginal lands prone to natural disasters like droughts or floods. So that makes them pretty vulnerable. Children. An estimated 146 million children are in developing countries are underweight, the result of chronic or acute hunger. All too often, child hunger is inherited. Up to 17 million children are born underweight annually, the results of inadequate nutrition before and during pregnancy. Women. Women are the world's primary food producers, yet cultural traditions and social structure structures often mean women are much more affected by hunger than, and poverty than men. A mother who is stunted or underweight due to an inadequate diet often give birth to low, weight, low birth weight children. Around 50% of pregnant women in developing countries are iron deficient. As a result, women, and in particular expectant mothers and nursing mothers, often need special or increased intake of food. So those are the hungry. Those are the hungry people in the world. That's where they reside. So what is causing hunger? 
Food has never before existed in such abundance. So why are 925 million people suffering from hunger every day? In purely quantitative terms, please remember that, that statement, in purely quantitative terms, there's enough food available to feed the entire population of seven billion people. And yet, one in nearly seven are going hungry. One in three children is underweight. Why does this exist? And they can be qualified in these categories, and hunger often exists because of one or more of these factors. Nature, war, a poverty trap, or a poverty cycle, agricultural infrastructure, and the over-exploitation of the environment. Nature. Natural disasters such as floods, tropical storms, and long periods of drought are on the increase, with calamitous consequences for food security in poor developing countries. Drought is now the most common cause of food shortages in the world. In many countries, climate change is exacerbating already the adverse natural conditions. Poor farmers traditionally deal with rain failure by selling off their livestock to cover their losses and pay for food. But excessive years, or even just as quickly as months, it's exacerbating their resources. So something that you may have heard in the news recently is the Sahel region. Um, this is an area in West Africa that is currently suffering from drought. Drought in the Sahel region of West Africa has brought hunger to millions of people for the third time in recent years. And meanwhile, coupled with conflict in Mali, this has forced at least 320,000 people to migrate into different areas of Mali and neighboring countries, creating a less food secure environment. So because this is so relevant to current times, let's dive into this a little bit more about the Sahel region. Why are people going hungry in the Sahel? So the rains come only once per, year, once per year in the African Sahel, and last year they were patchy and they were late. That's a recipe for disaster for people that depend solely on the food that they can grow. Uh, when rains don't come, harvests fail, animals die, and people start going hungry. And when people start going hungry, they typically migrate, they revolt, or they die. Which countries have been hit by the drought? Uh, the drought is affecting a swath of territory that covers um, Chad, Niger, Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, the Gambia, Cameroon, and um, Nigeria, northern Nigeria. So just to go back to the map, um, it's just that western part of West Africa. So it's just a swath of land territory. So what other factors have affected the Sahel? Um, bad harvests this year have driven up food prices at a time of year when they're typically pretty affordable. High fuel costs, pest infestations haven't helped, and the conflict in Mali has been a major factor forcing 320,000 people to flee their homes and seek refuge elsewhere. Um, so that's, that's a huge issue. Um, in an area where people depend so much on agricultural security, how do farm, small far, farmers survive when they don't grow enough food? During hard times, families will often sell their land or animals in order to buy food. That's called, obviously, a neg negative coping strategy because it leaves them poorer and more likely to go hungry in the long term. When they run out of things to sell, families have little choice but to move to cities abroad in search of work and food. So that's the Sahel region and a particularly relevant example of a natural disaster. Uh, the Sahel also couples um, another common factor for hunger, which is war and conflict. Since 1992, the proportion of short and long-term food crisis that can be attributed to human causes has more than doubled, rising from 15% to 35%. Um, and these emergencies are triggered by human conflicts. In war, food sometimes becomes a weapon. Soldiers, soldiers will starve opponents into submission by seizing food or livestock and systematically wrecking local markets. Fields and water wells are often mined or contaminated, forcing farmers to abandon their land. This is something that World Food Program had a huge difficulty dealing with in the Horn of Africa last year in the areas of southern Somalia, where there is no governing body. Um, so they were forced to deal with food aid in having direct conversations with militant groups like Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda, which made a very difficult situation for food security. <clears throat> so in 
So the poverty trap, I talked a little bit about this in the Sahel region. In developing countries, farmers often cannot afford the seed they need to plant, the tools they need to ply their trade, um, and others have no land or water or education to lay the foundation for a secure future. The poverty stricken do not have enough money to buy or produce enough food for themselves and their families, and in turn, they are weaker. So in short, the poor are hungry, and the hunger traps them in their poverty. And once the cycle starts, it's a very difficult cycle to break. Agricultural infrastructure, luckily there is going to be a whole separate discussion on this later on in the day because I could go on for days about this one, but in the long term, improved agricultural output offers the quickest fix for poverty and hunger. Too many developing countries lack key agricultural infrastructure such as roads, warehouses, and irrigation. The results are high transport costs, lack of storage facilities, and unreliable water resources. And all of those conspire to limit agricultural yields. Last one that causes hunger. Um, Over-exploitation of environment. Poor farming practices, deforestation, overcropping, and overgrazing are exhausting the Earth's fertility um, and spreading the roots of hunger. Increasingly, the world's fertile land is under threat from erosion, erosion and desertification. This also has to deal with climate change issues, which there is another discussion on that later on this afternoon, too. Last question we're gonna ask, what is malnutrition and why is this so important when dealing with global hunger? Malnutrition is simply a lack of nutrition. A malnourished person finds their body has difficulty doing normal, normal things such as growing and resisting disease. Physical work becomes problematic and even learning abilities can be diminished. For women, pregnancy becomes risky and they cannot be sure of producing uh, good or enough breast milk. When a person is not getting enough food or not getting the right so sort of food, malnutrition is just around the corner. Disease is often a factor, either as a result or a contributing cause. Even if people do get enough to eat, they will become malnourished if the food they eat does not provide the proper micronutrients to meet nutritional requirements. So malnutrition, it's the largest contributor to disease. Malnutrition at an early age leads to reduced physical and mental development during childhood. Iodine deficiency is the world's greatest single cause of mental retardation and brain damage. So the fortified foods that are needed for a child's development is integral in reducing the hunger trap and the poverty cycle of hunger. Undernutrition affects school performance and studies have shown it often leads to a lower income as an adult. It also causes women to give birth to low birth weight babies. Eliminating malnutrition involves sustaining the quality and quantity, so it's a, it's a two punch quality and quantity of food a person eats as well as adequate health care and a healthy environment. So that was a lot of information. We talked about what is hunger, who the hungry are, where hunger is, and different contributing factors for hunger. Um, because this is a teacher's institute, I do not feel bad about doing this. So you're just gonna shout it out, true or false, to these statements. There isn't enough food to feed the world. You got it, there is false. There is enough food to feed the world today for everyone to have nourishment necessary to live a healthy and active life, but it is often a question of access. We need to be more efficient, more sustainable, and more fair in how we grow and distribute food. And this largely means supporting smallholder farmers and making sure that safety nets, such as school meals, are in place for people to rely on in times of emergency. Good job. Resolving hunger means ensuring people have enough to eat. Sorry. False, <laughs> false-ish. Um, ensuring people have enough to eat is definitely a contributor to alleviating hunger, but the more important factor here is ensuring people have the right nutrition in order to just sustain a long, healthy, active life. Good job. Droughts and other natural disasters are mostly to blame for hunger. False. Emergencies only account for, does anyone remember this statistic? Hey, 
Why? 8% of the world's nearly 1 billion people that are going to bed hungry every night. Hunger exists when food is unavailable in markets. False. People can go hungry even when there's plenty of food around. It's the question of access to people. Can people afford the food um, that they can get at local markets? All of the world's hungry live in Africa. False. Where do, all of, where do most of the world's hungry people live? In the Pacific, you guys are rocking. Hunger is basically a health issue. Are you catching the theme here? You guys shouldn't be so timid. False. People can go hungry. Uh, uh, one of one, excuse me, I am back in my, the reality of the issue is that um, hunger is not just a health issue, it's also an education issue that, uh, that affects economies as well. Hungry children struggle to focus, learn, and even attend school. Without education, it's much harder for them to grow up and contribute to the growth of a national economy. Last one. There are more pressing issues than global hunger. False, thank you so much for agreeing with me on this one. Um, when populations are hungry, economies suffer, people fight, and farmers can't grow their crops effectively. We all need to tackle hunger uh, to be able to resolve environmental, economic, and security issues. So thank you for playing along. Um, so we have a big problem here, and we talked a lot about those factors, and now we're moving on to the more positive end of this presentation, is how do we solve global hunger, because we do know how. So I have a little video to um, hopefully get you guys jazzed about this. So yes, this is a WFP video, but what was just seen and what will um, be talked about next is something that a lot of development agencies have come together to research and understand the solutions, the causes of hunger, and what will help alleviate global hunger. So the first of which, we'll just pass by this. This is nutrition for under twos. This is what we're gonna be talking about. Food relief in emergencies, food vouchers, and support to smallholder farmers. Thanks guys, really helpful today. Food for training, meals for kids in school. Food vouchers, food for training, and meals for kids in school all um, fall under a safety net program. So this is where populations can fall back on something in times of emergency or great stress. Nutrition for children under two. Just on a personal note, this guy is my screensaver. Obviously, um, in my line of work, I cross a lot of grim photos and statistics and this, this little guy helps me through some of those hard times. Um, providing nutritious food for uh, women when they are pregnant or breastfeeding into children under the age of two ensures children can develop healthy minds and bodies. We've talked about this. Research indicates that it's critical to improve nutrition during the first 1,000 days of life, and that's from pregnancy until the child's second birthday. During these 1,000 days, adequate nutrition has the greatest impact on a child's cognitive and physical development. So this is actually when the brain develops and grows. Malnutrition during this period limits cognitive abilities, stunts growth, and increases susceptibility to both chronic and infectious disease. The consequences of poor nutrition have ramifications throughout adulthood and then are typically passed on to the next generation um, when people that are chronically hunger, these women and girls have children of their own. So it's a cycle that again, once it starts, it's very difficult to break if it's not prevented and or treated. 
Food relief and emergencies, it's critical that we still provide food aid in times of emergencies because we do need to assist populations in getting out of the hunger shock. If someone is in a hunger shock, they are not going to be able to move themselves out of that initial terrible first level and moving through the phases of alleviating hunger in the future. Food vouchers, a safety net. When food is in the markets but poor people can't afford it, food vouchers help ensure vulnerable families get the food that they need. Food vouchers are basically digital food and they come through mobile phones, smart cards, e-vouchers delivered by text messaging and other innovative methods. Beneficiaries can cash in their vouchers at local stores and markets. So this is also a really great way to support and boost local economy. Okay, if I had a soapbox, I would get up on it right now, but support to small farmers. There are more than five million small-scale farmers worldwide. Most of them are women. Many suffer from chronic hunger because they don't grow enough food or the right kind of food to feed and nourish their families. Because these small farmers represent half of the world's hungry people, the attention of the international community has been refocused on the importance of sustainably boosting their agricultural production. Uh, the G8, for example, <laughs> this was a key, uh, key issue discussed at the G8. Effective agricultural development programs increase farmers' ability and farmers' incomes through more consistent use of agricultural best practices, increased attention to post-production handling, storage, and processing, and better linking of producers to various types of markets. So you're not only focusing on the training and the access to seed and fertilizer, you're also helping them with post-production management, which includes transportation, which includes storage, and access to competitive markets. Food for training, uh, giving poor women uh, food rations in return for attending training courses where they learn skills to help them earn money gives them a way to support themselves. So this is also a safety net program that has been pretty effective. I saved the best for last. Um, school meals, and also this is the most relevant to the audience today. Um, school meals is one of the most effective ways in combating the cycle of hunger. Providing meals for children in schools where they get food, they need to concentrate on their lessons. It also means that they stay in school, so it's also an incentive tool. Basic education is one of the most effective investments a country can make for improving economies and creating a literate and self-reliant population. So some basic facts, and I'm sure that I am preaching to the choir here, but studies show it is more difficult for children to learn without adequate food and nutrition. There are 66 million primary school age children who attend classes hungry across the developing world. There are 67 million school age children who do not attend school at all. Poor households must often choose between sending their children to school or to work in the fields. And this is particularly compromising for girls and young women. A daily school meal provides a strong incentive for families to send their children to school and to keep them there. And it's also very cost effective. It only takes 25 cents to feed a child a nutritious food, a cup of food for a day. So what is a school meal? Um, children are fed breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but, or, excuse me, bref breakfast or lunch, or they have the option to take home, take home rations to their family if they are in particularly vulnerable situations. Meals can be prepared at school or in the community or delivered from a centralized kitchen. As far as possible, the food is procured locally. Why school meals? So many reasons, but these are four pretty important ones. Nutrition. As we've discussed, when combining micronutrient fortification, school meals offer important nutrition for the sound development of minds for, for kids in school. Social protection. School meals can break the cycle of hunger, poverty, and child exploitation, again, focusing on the compromising position that young women and girls are often put in in developing countries. Education, school meals encourage, encourage poor households to send their children to school and keep them there. Programs often target girls, enabling them to gain better education in societies that they're traditionally excluded from. 
and community building. Schools are at the center of many villages and communities. School meals connect teachers to parents, to cooks, to small farmers. So it's an increased cycle of communication that better sustains communities in times of need. So I'm gonna end this presentation um, with a video, a very special video. This is a Molly, this is Molly. Um, and Molly is a WFP school meal beneficiary. And what the country office in Kenya did was gave Molly a flip cam to document portions of her life as it, they appear to her. So you'll be introduced to Molly and her family, and then it takes you through her school meal experience. And why I want you to see this is because this has been a particularly effective uh, tool for US teachers, because there is a part in here that shows how Molly's story has engaged students worldwide, but particularly in the US. You're going to film your friends in school, your life at home, your family at home. You can also get somebody to film. OK? Thank you. This is my cousin. 11, he also 12, know how to 13, read 14, and write 15, one to 16, 100. 17, he is now practicing 18, how to 19, read them. 30. My name is Molly. I learn in a school. I learn in Valley View Academy in Madare Slums in Nairobi. He is now writing his name. Though he does not go to school, but I just coach him in the house. <laughs> my cousin and my and the other one from our neighborhood were playing football. I want to dance. I want to sing my conjunction. I like my conjunction. I sleep like a conjunction. I don't like a conjunction. I can't use it. It's ruled inadmissible because Adam can't be cross examined Most children spend most of their time watching at televisions, but they do not know that they are just destroying their lives. This is my shoe. It is too old, but I can't throw it because I don't have another shoe. I spent most of my time doing school work and when I come at home from school, I first of all wash the utensils. Then wait for my aunt to come and prepare for the dinner. This place is very dirty. It's where children comes to play. Some even release their waste product here. How funny is it that even children can conserve the environment? The elders are just leaving the environment to be destroyed. But we know that the children can even conserve the environment better than the adults. My father and, and my cousin were feeding the monkeys. This is known as Sim Sim. Many people like it because it, it's too sweet. These are ground nuts. They have not yet been packed. They normally be packed in papers of 10 shillings and some of 5 shillings. These are what my parents sell for us to earn our daily bread. Here's where I do buy my mandazi while going to school the mandazis are being cooked this is how they are rolled and then put into the fire they're surely very sweet and they're cooked with lots of cleanliness and seriousness that is why they are being liked by most of the people around this place people do also, also buy the chapatis from here 
Yes, here people buy the CDs. They like buying them here because because this the CDs sold here are, do not have scratches, and there is where the the woods are being sold. The the woods that are used to light fire. Yes, the bill, the billboard. It it normally lights at night from from 6:30 p.m. It lights very bright and prevents the thieves from stealing because they'll be caught by the police. I used to wake up at 5:30 a.m. Then prepare for school. At home, when we have been given some work, I use this table to write. And at night, I sleep on this chair. Today being on a Monday, I'm very happy that I'm back to school. This is my school. This is my class. Times 100. Over buying price. Our school is no more space. The, the class is congested with the lots of desks that when you want to move from one seat to another, you, are, you have to jump over the desks. Yes. The yes. How are they? The teacher is now collecting the papers after we have finished our midterm English test papers. Here is the kitchen. After the maze is boiled, they'll add the piece which is inside the basin. taking food at, at school than at home? Many children cannot manage to get food at home they, because they depend on this food during lunch time. What is your name? Christiana Madi. Where, where do you come from? I come from a city farm supermarket. Where, how old are you? I am six years old. Where do you learn? I learn in Valley Academy. What is your best subject? English and Max. My mother and you are I'm 12 years old. I'm Lavinia and I'm 12 years old. My name is Francesca and I live in Rome. I'm 12 years old. I saw your video about you and I really enjoyed it. In our school we have lots of people from many different countries. This is the Italian flag next to the Kenyan flag. You can put This is my say. class. I like this. I'm Lucas. Oh, yes. Lucas is best friend. <laughs> now I'm, I'm making a mullet for my family for lunch. I like to draw because I like it. it's my imagination that is my head. I sleep in this bed that's over me. And now I'm imagining what you are doing now, Molly. Now it's in the film. It was burned, done by children from Italy after they saw your film. What do you think? I think that the life is not too much different because people know that Islam is a dirty place. From their film, their place is clean and from my film, the place is dirty. I think that is the big challenge. The children in Italy Live, live in another world than from Molly's world because 
That's amazing to have two Michael Jacksons in different worlds. <laughs> one in Italy and another one in Mathari, in Molly's house. And that means they have some, I mean, a common thinking. They have a common thinking and uh, to me that is good. Because uh, we thought that maybe children away from Kenya are different from our children. Yet they are think almost the same thing. I think they have a lot to eat because I saw her preparing food, she was preparing eggs. In the same, after eggs, she went to prepare the vegetables. And here in slums, you can get that somebody just prepares one type of food to eat daily. Sit in the center. Yes. Molly? Yeah. Molly, you need to see. Yes. <laughs> Three cameras. Nice. Hello. Hi. I'm Molly, and she is my classmate. Her name is Catherine Kavoy. I'm Lucas. I'm Idris. And I'm Francesca. Well Food Program has been helping me since I joined Valley View because it is hardly to get food at home. Do you like going to school? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah man. <laughs> we, we don't like homework. There were, two weeks ago in Rome there was snow and we couldn't go to school. Yeah, school got cancelled because of the snow. We had like that much snow. We've never seen snow. Oh, really? Yeah. really? It's like white and like watery and icy and, and it's very imagine hot. like okay, imagine it's raining ice. That would be hail. A bit. Yeah. Hail. Yeah. Do you know how to speak Kiswahili? No. no. How do you say hello? Habari. 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 What would you like to be when you grow up? Yeah, doctor or a famous person. If you could meet one famous person, who would it be? Barack, Barack Obama. Obama. Is it the picture behind you? That's the Colosseum. It's one of the best monuments in Rome. People called gladiators. They were fighters, would fight with each other, and people would sit around and watch. Cool. And over here is the school, right? Yeah, yes. Right down here. And you are very happy to be in this place and share and share and share the life in slums with you people. Thank you. Thank you. you Bye. 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 Peace and love. <laughs> Molly, you have new shoes. Yes, I have new shoes that I was just given by the class teacher for good performance in school. Oh, well done. That's Molly. Um, and that concludes the presentation. Um, I hope you learned um, a broad overview of what hunger is, who the hungry are, and different factors that go into solving global hunger, um, in addition with an action item that you can bring into your classroom. On WFP's website, there are two links for students and for teachers. Um, and for teachers, and I'll be going over this a little bit in our lunch session today, there are a wealth of lesson plans, and there is one de dedicated specifically to Molly. So thank you very much.
Hi, uh, my name's Deanna Macbeth, and I was wondering more about um, solutions. Um, you mentioned uh, the, you know, focusing on the first 1,000 days of life and food relief and emergencies, food vouchers, and the other things that you mentioned. And I was just wondering, what are the major um, world players who are, you know, involved in those initiatives currently? Or if you could just speak a little more on the practical end of how that's currently being addressed and where you think it should be moving. Of course. Um, what's great about the solutions is it's received a lot of international attention, and that was confirmed um, and reaffirmed uh, in a wonderful and positive way by the G8 meeting that um, happened here a couple weeks ago in Chicago, which was really fun. Um, so where that, what that means, the G8's uh, dedication to furthering international development and food aid by focusing on emergency and non-emergency solutions. And non-emergency solutions means developing projects, de developing and implementing projects in the developing countries. They have um, the G8, so the members of the G8 countries um, are the biggest players right now. And implementing and moving those forward is outlined and has been outlined by the G8 plan. So that's the international community. On the US side, um, perhaps some of you have heard of the Farm Bill. Um, and the Farm Bill is a huge piece of legislation that is passed and re um, brought up every, every five years. And so we are currently in that year, um, which is very exciting and very nerve wracking for um, all of food policy. We want to make sure that our legislatures and our Congress are making the right decisions by all of food policy, by distribution, by labeling of food, and then by food aid. Um, where I'll talk a little bit about where food aid has come from and where it has gone to, uh, where it is moving forward, um, which I think are pretty positive. Um, I came prepared for this question. So the evolution of food aid. Um, Roger Thoreau is a pretty renowned uh, author in the food security world, and he is actually here at the Chicago Council on World Affairs. And he said this um, about the recent um, food aid delivery to the Sahel region. This is the US response. The World Food Program announced that it had received more than 100 million through the agency, US Agency for International Development to provide urgent food assistance to some 9 million people across the Sahel. Of that contribution, 28 million was in cash uh, to purchase food from African farmers. Um, the US donation also included an initial consignment of 7,500 metric tons, so that is in-kind food. Um, and then additional food supplies will be shipped in the US in August. So why is this? so renowned. Uh, this is because this is a very recent approach to food aid, especially the U.S. and their involvement with food aid. The U.S. in previous years has been anything that is marked by a U.S. ship, um, U.S. branded food, U.S. commodities, that was what was shipped over as food aid. And the thought behind that was very good intentioned. It helped our economies, it helped our farmers, and it helped our workforce. But what that didn't help was the beneficiaries. It took months um, for the food aid to arrive. And the US is the largest contributor to the World Food Program. Um, so, the US, so the beneficiaries from around the world in times of crisis were heavily relying on our support. Um, and so this is a very positive stepping stone in that there are, there's a three-pronged approach here. Yes, we are still delivering food via cargo ships and air flight, um, and those are our own crops and commodities, and that will arrive later on in August. Um, what has happened um, is we have been pre-positioning U.S commodities um, in different areas of the world. So that means in the Sahel region, there is a massive distribution center where we can access food and deliver it to people in need much more quickly and much more effectively and cost effectively than shipping everything over at one time via flight and or cargo. Another positive development here is cash. 
Um, obviously, they need cash. Um, World Food Program needs cash in a hurry in times of emergency in order to best supply food, um, support other programs that are in operation that help out with food insecurity. So that's a little bit about um, where it has been and where it is going. And to answer your question, it's going in a very positive direction. And thankfully, the US is a huge contributor in that effect. Any other questions? Another quote from um, Roger Thoreau's book, Enough, is in the past, it's always been um, a Band-Aid for the poor is an investment for the rich. And that, that's something they're trying to change. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, one of the solutions that you are advocating is uh, the uh, development and encouragement of smallholder farms. Mm -hmm. And so my question is uh, two, uh, I guess, two-pronged, if you will. Uh, I'd like to know what you mean by smallholder farms. Are they small-scale commercial? Or are they subsistence farms you know, for uh, families? Or So that's one question. And so my second question is, if all these smallholder farms are all um, encouraged, uh, wouldn't you have the economies of scale to play into that? And thus, if you have that, if the economies of scale isn't in there, wouldn't the prices of food rise? And so if the prices of food rise, how will the poor then access the food? Mm -hmm. Um, excellent question. Um, to start with your first question, or your last question first, um, with the world's hungry, over half of them being smallholder farmers, if they're given the resources and access to a competitive market, and the competitive market, um, I'll give an example of a World Food Program program. Um, even I would like to speak from a global hunger perspective, but I can bring in examples from the current work of the World Food Program, which is called Purchase for Progress. And what Purchase for Progress strives to do, it's actually in the pilot state right now, um, is it purchases from smallholder farmers, which have a wide definition range. Um, so I can't speak to the definition of what a smallholder farmer is. It's not quite as big as a commercial farm, but it is not a garden-sized plot of, plot of farming. Um, and perhaps Sam can approach that uh, in his presentation coming up. Um, but what Purchase for Progress does is World Food Program has invested in training, seed, fertilization, um, when partnering with private sector. So Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son, is a huge farmer. Um, and he has a lot of investment in the global development of smallholder farmers. Um, other contributors include Cargill and Monsanto and other larger scale organizations that have money to give in that sense. And so what has happened is these countries have developed efficient smallholder farms in which World Food Program can then take and purchase the emergency food aid that they are delivering to other countries directly from them. So the World Food Program is giving them the direct access to the market. They're buying their food bought with using fair prices, et cetera. And so that's the model moving forward, not necessarily for food aid relief, but giving access to smallholder farmers, competitive marketplace. And we're, I mean, the hope is, obviously, is to alleviate the global, the, the number of global people that are going hungry in the world, which is 500 million that are smallholder farmers. So if we give them access to market, the tools, beginning and ending tools, we hope that we can alleviate a big part of that. Does that answer your question, mostly? Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious if the, res the American response to hunger in Asia and the Pacific Islands is similar to the response in Africa. Um, yes. Um, the response, the, there are long-standing country offices, as mentioned, World Food Program, again, speaking from World Food Program's perspective, there are country offices throughout the world. And in those country offices, they're staffed and they are constantly reporting and evaluating on programs. What's happening in Africa specifically is there are larger scale emergencies that require um, a lot of emergent mobilization of the private sector to donate their food and their assistant expertise and money um, to get the food where they need it the fastest. Um, and why Africa is um, such a hot spot is because of the increase of natural disasters. I'm wondering about um, the whole notion about 
producing food for that wider market. And I'm thinking, for example, I lived in Bolivia recently where uh, quinoa is now being shipped to the United States. We're eating it here, mm -hmm. but it was one of the few foods that they could rely on there um, at, to avoid malnutrition. So malnutrition is skyrocketed in Bolivia while we eat a product we obviously don't need here. So how do you manage projects that have the potential to really malnourish people? How do we manage product projects? I can't speak to that, and perhaps we can speak a little bit after a little bit after the presentation, so I can get a better understanding of what your experience was and specifics of where you were. Um, if I'm understanding the question, it's the paradox of we have quinoa in abundance here, but they don't have it there, um, and that is something that yeah, it's an export. exporting. Okay. Right. I can't speak to that um, as a World Food Program representative because um, we don't deal with the exportation of food. Um, we deal with bringing food in. But it sounded to me, if I heard you correctly, you're really um, encouraging people to grow for that larger market so they make income, mm -hmm. which is exactly what they're doing in Bolivia, and it's actually malnourishing a, a substantial number of people there. There we go. That's a great question. So the exportation of the food that we are rallying for is actually for regional consumption. So it's not going to come to whole food markets and to organic food stores here in the U.S. We hope to sustain urban, or excuse me, smallholder farmers to grow their products, the products that work best in their communities and nourish the most, the largest amount of people, and then keep it within that region. A question about yeah. those first thousand days yes. and early childhood nutrition, breastfeeding versus formula and all of the scandal. What's been going on there? Can you tell us? Well, we are huge advocates of breastfeeding. Um, so in refugee camps, obviously, sometimes breastfeeding um, is it cannot be done uh, because women have reached a point of no return in terms of their own malnourishment. So in that sense, uh, World Food Program has nutritionists that work with the private sector to develop these projects that sustain infants um, and mothers in hopes to rebuild their nutrition. So in all instances and in all cases, we want mothers to nourish their own infant children with their own breast milk because that is the most fortified, that's the best possible nourishment that a child could get. But in times of emergency, um, obviously compromises need to be made to that effect. I hope I'll be able to phrase this in a <laughs> coherent manner. But in the beginning of your talk, you talked about one of the sort of focuses of the World Food Program being giving voice to people in the different regions for how um, they see development needs, I think mm -hmm. is what you were mm -hmm. saying. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that aspect of developing a sustainable program that involves the voice of people in the, diff the different regions. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the second part of the question then would be, how do you take into account sort of a framework of global capitalism that will allow for keeping food in a region? So you grow it, you, you don't export it, you keep it in the region so that people do get the nutrition. How do mm -hmm. we address the sort of conflicting, in some ways, mm -hmm. priorities? Okay, good, good questions. Um, so the first question, no one wants to receive food aid. No one wants to be in the position of feeling in, that you are in such an emergency um, that you have to walk for 20 to 30 days deciding whether or not it's worth, can you survive carrying both children um, to the refugee camp and do you have to leave one behind? No one wants to be put in that position. Um, and receiving food rations, and these rations, this food is not typically what they eat on a daily basis. It's fortified food, and that the reason behind that is um, a lot of reasons. Obviously, we need to fortify the food, but also for security reasons. We want to limit um, thievery with food. So if we are giving food um, that is a staple in common areas, that creates further conflict for um, food insecure nations. So that's one precaution that we take. So 
giving voice to the people and to the people that are affected by emergencies and um, other factors that contribute to hunger is a huge priority of the World Food Program. We like to say that we are looking to work ourselves out of a job. Um, and so each one of the programs, they, they work with the except in emergency situations where it is an emergency and the, the one thing that we need to do is get food to the people that need it most, um, is the stages of hunger, alleviating people from the hunger shock into nutrition. Um, there are trainings, there are uh, learning opportunities for people and for mothers that just received um, you know, a fortified vitamin, uh, learned how best to take care of themselves. Each step of the way, World Food Program is there to provide training, extra resources, giving them the tools that they need to sustain themselves in the future to prevent against future hunger shocks, which include drought and tsunamis and earthquakes, which are, un you, you, you can predict those. We do have early warning systems. Um, but so yeah, no one wants food aid. Um, and that's and our, our job is to give people a voice so that they can say they can work themselves out of a food insecure situation. In terms of capitalism, um, World Food Program is yes, it's a United Nations uh, agency. However, we work hopefully in an ideal situation hand in glove with nation states. Um, so we work with governments. Um, encouraging them to implement safety net programs, encouraging them to ensure that hunger shocks are not met with the same sort of dire need that they have in XYZ years. Um, so we can only control so much and we can only suggest so much um, and we really rely on the good citizenship of, of nation states to really take care of their citizens and population. This might be out of your realm, but I'm, I'm asking because um, we have hunger right here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe it's not on the scale that you're talking about, but maybe it is. But I, I know that in the school lunch programs, the food is really terrible. I mean, it's high in carbs. There's very little fresh food. So there are families that are coming, and that's where the kids get their main meal for the day. And it's not nutritionally sound, and it's... It's, it's really awful food. So I'm just wondering if your organization is doing anything about that, mm. or if you know, or if anyone here knows about programs where we can work with our kids to work mm -hmm. on something local like that. Um, well, I can speak specifically to World Food Program. Uh, well, I'll just, I'll switch into a personal gear. Um, one hungry child is one hungry child too many, and that doesn't matter if it's here in the US or abroad. And hunger is an overarching issue um, that has no borders. Hunger is seen throughout the world and the causes, uh, malnourishment is seen again throughout the world. Um, we do, luckily, um, we do not have refugee camps here in America and we do not have to make those harsh decisions of um, you know, food aid and how to take care of families, but there are people in the U.S. that are wondering where their next meal is going to come from. Um, the World Food Program, we work from hunger from a global perspective, um, but there are several upstanding organizations here in the United States that World Food Program does pu partner with in order to push forward the messaging of hunger. Um, the more people know about hunger and what it means to feed the world, the better, because that advances all of our, um, all of our goals in, in creating a more food secure world. And one of those partners is here in Chicago called Feeding America. Our World Food Program's new executive director, Earthrin Cousin, is, came from Feeding America. Um, and I know that all of Wednesday we'll be dealing with uh, domestic food issues and then specifically with here in Illinois in the Chicago area. So you have a lot to look forward to. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Erin Kupke. Thank you. <laughs>